So today I have one of my rare repeat guests because he's a guy who is just moving so fast. I don't know when the guy sleeps and doing so much for the professional law enforcement that I had to have him back. Kyle Reyes, welcome back to the NPA report. Thanks for having me. You know, you are dressed way nicer than I am. I feel like a schlub compared to you. You look like a supermodel and I look like they just picked me up on the border. That's okay. You don't really have time to uh, get fancy and uh, because you have so much going on. Uh, you are, uh, you are, so you are the president, the CEO of the 1776 Project, which uh, includes so much more talk about it. Yeah, so uh, it, it's a God thing. Um, I got a phone call from the founder of law enforcement today. I've been the executive director for a couple of years, and he said, I'm, I'm going to uh, shut down the platform. He's full-time law enforcement. He just didn't want to do it anymore. He had a lot going on in law enforcement. He's been in for almost 40 years. And I said, what do you mean you're going to shut it down? He said, I just I don't have time to do this. So I said, well, we can't lose that voice for law enforcement. He said, all right, make me an offer. And so I did. And so we closed on July 4th, which was fitting because you know, America. And on July 6th, I got a phone call from our biggest competitor and they said, Hey, you interested in acquiring us? Now we had had an NDA in place. Nobody knew about it. I said, you're such a jerk. Who told you? He goes, told me that you're interested. I said, no, I told you that I bought LET. He goes, wait, what? I go, you didn't know? He goes, I had no idea. I said, then why are you calling me? He goes, I really wanted to see if you wanted to acquire us. Um, and so we began having those conversations along with a number of others. And in October, we closed on uh, the acquisition of Blue Lives Matter, Police Tribune, Mike the Cops YouTube page, Law Enforcement Family, Law Enforcement for Life. So um, super blessed to have what's now the largest police news outlet in the world. Uh, it's one of the largest in the 2A space. And uh, the way that we look at it is that we need to resurrect that tidal wave of support for law enforcement by being boots on the ground for them, by deploying resources all over the country to share their stories. Um, and uh, we've got some pretty big plans. That's so exciting. Full disclosure, I sit on the LET advisory board very proudly. And that's one of the reasons that the National Police Association is so proud of you and what you are doing, not yeah. just because you uh, support American law enforcement like we do, but you are also one of the uh, biggest supporters of a citizen Second Amendment right to protect themselves. And, you know, this is the thing that people don't understand. You always hear in the media, you know, well, police officers want more gun control. You know, law enforcement wants more gun laws. Law enforcement doesn't want more gun laws. Police chiefs like more gun laws. Um, but the the truth, the reality is, is the boots on, your, on the ground law enforcement officers revere the Second Amendment. And we appreciate armed and trained citizens, right, Kyle? A hundred percent. I mean, we, we hear that from all over. Um, you know, you have some chiefs who are, are nothing more than political wannabes in uniform. They have greater aspirations. I, I understand it. Um, but that's a very different person than the elected sheriff in uh, Texas that we met with in Hidalgo County two weeks ago, who he's a Democrat. And he said, we need the Second Amendment. It's absolutely crucial. And I think that um, society believes that we are much further apart than we really are. A lot of that is media spin and media hype. Um, you know, the reason I brought together our advisory board, and I'm so grateful for your involvement in it, is because I'm not a police officer, right? I, I haven't been out there doing this work. And so I wanted to make sure that we remain true and authentic to telling the stories behind the uniforms and the stories of the challenges that they face every day. And so this advisory board is made up of the heads of the largest police groups in the country, including National Border Patrol Council, the Federal Law Enforcement Officer Association, TMPA. Uh, we've got Sheriff Lamb, Sheriff Daniels. We've got the federal law enforcement, I'm sorry, the uh, National Law Enforcement Officer Memorial Fund. We've just got some amazing people. And one of the challenges that we face, and, and I hope that you will continue to hold us accountable on this and, and that all of your viewers will as well, is that we don't want to politicize law enforcement, right? Because they have been politicized by, by the system and by society. But by the same token, how do you not report on certain things? Like what isn't political in law enforcement these days? 
the defund the police movement, the border crisis, the opioid crisis. And so there's really sort of that that balance that we've struggled with for years and will continue to struggle with of how do you keep politics out of policing when policing has become so politicized? It's It's definitely a challenge. Well, and you know, you, I talk to cops about this all over the country. When I was, when I was a rookie cop in the, in the eighties, one of the first things they told you was you keep your beliefs to yourself, your religious beliefs, your political beliefs, all that you're out there to do a job. Nobody cares about your opinions. And, uh, and, and that was, I always to this day believe that, that law enforcement should not be politicized because you know it, and it was my job for 29 years to protect people regardless of how they voted but now policing has become so incredibly political and as the spokesman for the national police association i will say that it's primarily conservative media that is is talking to me and and trying to get stories out there and this and that and i know it's the same for law enforcement today and 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 all of your outshoots is it just when you report on law enforcement issues today, it tends to come uh, organically from a conservative standpoint, doesn't it? Well, I, I mean, here's what it comes down to. We believe in constitutional values and constitutional principles. And every man and woman who serve and protect our communities or our country took an oath of hold and defend the Constitution. And so we stand behind those values and those principles. Um, God is at the core of everything that we do, and we seek to serve him by supporting those who serve our communities and our country. Uh, we do have the International Conference of Police Chaplains, the President Jim on our board of advisors, um, amazing guy, because we believe that, listen, I'm not saying everyone's got to be Christian or Jewish or Muslim or whatever, um, but there have been a number of studies done that found that when an officer is um, is drained of spirituality, which the job often does, that they're unable to perform to the same level that they used to perform because there's a physical component, there's a mental component, and there's a spiritual component. And so it's uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, especially after the defund the police movement and, and then in the middle of this catastrophic border crisis, which I don't care what people say, every state is a border state now. Well, so let's talk about the border. I'm sitting right now, 80 miles from the southern border. Um, we have been we have been sounding the alarm for a couple of years now, but I think it's finally coming into the mainstream attention span of almost everyone that that now in 2024, it's a it's a it's not just a crisis at the southern border; it's an invasion. Talk about that. So it is, and I would take it a step further, and I would say it is absolutely, without a question, an existential threat to America. And so I, I want to give you a little bit of context about what I've seen in the last few weeks personally. Being on the border in Arizona, we uh, were blessed to, to hang out with a police chief in Tucson, who's an amazing guy, by the way. Uh, we went up in the air with the aerial team. We went out on the border with the National Border Patrol Council. And then we went out to Texas. We met with a bunch of border sheriffs, a bunch of border chiefs. We went out with Texas DPS. Um, I mean, amazing experience. But but here's what we saw. So you're seeing numbers finally being reported in the mainstream media of 10, 15,000 apprehensions per day. Well, what people don't realize is that, first of all, 95% plus of those apprehensions are being released into America to wherever they want to go. They're literally out of the Tucson airport being given papers and flown across the country. Now, listen, you go try and hop on an airplane without an ID. Good luck with that. Right. But this is happening and we don't have any background on these people. So you sneak into the country, you declare asylum. If you don't have a criminal record in America, where you are not on a terror watch list that has been identified by our federal government, you're free to go. You could be a convicted murderer in another country. We don't have those records. And so you're being released into the interior of the U.S. So that's problem number one. Problem number two. So you're seeing now the 10 to 15,000 people a day, which, by the way, for context, your average small town in America is 5,000 people. So we're now seeing two to three small towns released into the U.S., every single day. But by the estimates of all of the law enforcement that we were out with, the number of gotaways could very well number twice as many. So if you go up, if you know it's easy to just declare asylum, right? 
I, I, you know, I'm trying to flee an evil government or bad people, the cartels, and you're going to be released. Why would you avoid apprehension? Well, we know why you would avoid apprehension, because these are the people who have been previously deported. There are felons in there. There are people with extensive criminal records. There are people with extensive terror ties. We have cartel members. And, and even more terrifying is that the number of single, young, fit, military age Chinese nationals, Pakistani nationals, Iranian nationals, Mauritania, some of the terror hotbeds of the world that are being caught in the what would have been gotaways. So now take those numbers, 10 to 15,000 a day times three, right? So we're talking as many as, as 45 to 50,000 people a day in some days that are coming into America. That is an invasion. And now you combine those numbers with the fact that we've had 262 OTMs or other than Mexico, people from countries other than Mexico that have touched the border in the last few months. You look at those numbers, you look at the fentanyl crisis, you look at the sex trafficking and the human trafficking. And then if you zoom out to the 40,000 foot overview, you look at the cargo that comes into America where we have less than 3% of cargo from overseas that comes into America that actually gets inspected before being shipped all over the country. We are set up for an absolute catastrophic nightmare of epic proportion. When you have Ray, the FBI director, now saying there are blinking red lights everywhere, that's a cover your butt kind of moment. That's a cover your butt statement because they know that we have terrorist activity in all 50 states right now. And as a dad of four little girls, that scares the hell out of me. As well, it should. You know, we we are, you know, since October 7th, we have been refreshed. Uh, this country has on what jihadism is what islamic terrorism looks like and just from a personal standpoint the tucson international airport is my home airport i travel a lot for work and uh and you know we have been again we've been seeing this for two years my husband and i we you know they they have the tsa pre-line the regular passenger line and then over here is the uh migrant line no one has id and we have seen over the last six to eight months kyle those passengers turn from, you know, moms with kids or family units, things like that, to mostly military age young men. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, they're Chinese, North African, Middle Eastern. And, uh, and, and I'll be honest, you know, and they're flying everywhere. They're on every single flight. And again, these are people, they speak absolutely no English, and so many of them, some of them are nice, but you know, so many of them are rude. They, but, and they all have brand new clothes, brand new shoes, brand new iPhone, pocket full of cash, an EBT card, credit card. And uh, they're going everywhere, including up to my native Chicago, where uh, just until a few weeks ago, they were living in our district police stations. And, uh, and now, you know, you're seeing them go additionally to Chicago and, and New York and, uh, you know, on and on and on and on and on. And even the mayors who once welcomed them there are uh, are saying, you know, enough is enough. And, you know, I know people that say, oh, these people are just looking for a better life, this and that. It is so far beyond that, uh, you know, that and, and again, you know this better than I do. We, we have passed that point of no return and we have passed the point of, oh, they're just here for a better life. And most of them seeking asylum don't meet asylum criteria. Am I correct? That's absolutely correct. And, and you know who else is seeking a better life? Homeless veterans, young struggling moms in Massachusetts, Florida, Texas, California, your average everyday person who is dealing with a, a massively increasing tax burden because we have overspent our great grandchildren's finances at this point. And so there, there's something to be said for charity begins at home. But, you know, not to sound like a, a conspiracy theorist here, right? But, you know, the what's the difference between a conspiracy theory and the truth? It's about six months. So we see these massive movements from certain people to effectively disarm Americans. Uh, more and more legislation that's being passed in states like Connecticut, where they say, hey, by the way, all those magazines that you have that were completely legal, now they're all illegal. And if you get caught with one, you're a felon. So as we see a clampdown and, and uh, growth in the gun control movement, we also saw that the Biden administration flat out told Israel, if you continue to hand out rifles to civilians, we will not allow guns to be shipped or support or financial support to be sent to Israel. 
if that is not a wake up moment after we saw th this catastrophe, this horrific incident in the beginning of October. And we know that it's only a matter of time before we see that at a much bigger scale here in America. Uh, every American right now needs to be taking stock of their own lives physically, emotionally, spiritually, and how they're going to protect their family when things go south. And, and what's the worst that comes out of that? We're overprepared and nothing happens. I'm OK with that. Well, and people are going to need the American law enforcement officer when things go bad. And that brings us back to exactly what you're trying to do, that after three and a half years of the demonization, the vilification of the American law enforcement officer, you know, primarily what you're trying to do is help prop up those cops, provide information to the citizens who support them and do everything we can. Because I think, don't you think, Kyle, that people have now realized that this this attack on our entire criminal justice system is not working out well for anyone? Yeah. I mean, I think people are starting to go, oh, you know what? Maybe this whole defund the police thing wasn't the greatest idea. And it's funny how that narrative is changing as we head into a presidential election, right? But, but you're absolutely right. People are waking up and, and starting to go, Man, they told me for the longest time I didn't need guns because police would protect me. But now we're getting rid of the police. I mean, if we were to go back to like 2010 and all of a sudden massive numbers of people were to start dying of heart attacks, would the solution be to go, you know what, we're going to we're going to defund cardiothoracic surgeons and cardiologists because clearly they suck at what they're doing. Well, we have a narrative that all of these unarmed people are being murdered by officers. Well, first of all, it's a false narrative. It's just not true. And, and the solution, if you really buy into that, how is the solution making any sense that we should actually take away funding and take away training? No, if anything, if you really believe that cops suck that much, Train them better, <laughs> give them more support, give them more staffing, give them more opportunities to better protect our population. You know, do you think that with things like the the fall of Minneapolis documentary now getting some traction, um, things like the Travis County uh, DA who indicted all these cops, a lot of those cases have been dropped. We now, now know the truth about cases like Breonna Taylor. Do you think those things are helping to shift the tide back toward law and order slowly the one thing that is playing a huge role in, in my argument that it's slowly is big tech big tech will do everything in their power to silence and censor the truth if it doesn't advance a very specific agenda. That's why you'll see a lot of these movies, a lot of the content, the articles surrounding these topics be throttled or shut down or de declared to be fake news by the fact checkers. The Hunter Biden laptop from hell, that was declared to be fake news leading into the last election, which meant when they declared it as fake news, it suppressed everything about the topic on big tech. The same thing's happening with the, the Gascon recall. The same thing's happening with, um, you know, the truth that comes out about some of these officer-involved shootings. And so, yes, I think that what we're starting to see is more of that sort of citizen journalist movement, um, the, the citizen journalist documentaries. I think it's crucial, and I think it has to grow organically. And that's one of the reasons that I bought these platforms is so that we can give a voice to that truth and to those stories and help expose the reality of what's happening. We're not afraid to call out dumb situations, right? And, and I'll say it right here, the whole uh, LAPD pulling that, that young dad's uh, gun permit for defending his wife and kids, we reached out to them, right? We gave them an opportunity. We said, there's got to be another story here. Like, help us to, to give you cover fire by telling what really happened. And they said, well, we're big supporters of the Second Amendment, so he can reapply for it. We were like, hold up. Did he get charged? Did he do anything wrong? Well, no, he didn't, but he yelled at officers. Well, yeah, I mean, guess what? Anybody would have been pretty pissed about that situation. So he said, if he didn't do anything wrong and he wasn't charged, then why should he have to reapply for something that never should have been taken? So we're not afraid to, to kind of get into the mud on situations like that. It sucks. We don't want to do it, but we also have to maintain the relationship between civilian and civil servant by being realists at the end of the day, by upholding the constitutional values that we believe in. And so, but on the flip side, our focus is truth. 
period. We want to humanize the men and women behind the uniforms. We want to show everybody in America what they are going through in law enforcement, on the border, in our cities, and our small communities every single day, because the mental health of our officers is rapidly deteriorating because of everything that we're talking about here. So what kind of different um, products do you offer, to, you know, uh, so that people can consume <clears throat> your your articles, your videos, all that? Talk about that. Sure. Uh, LawEnforcementToday.com. You can go sign up for our newsletter. We send out I don't know, six, eight articles a day through the newsletter. Um, we have, the, you can find us on Facebook, Law Enforcement Today, the Police Tribune, Blue Lives Matter. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Um, we have a huge following for Blue Lives Matter on LinkedIn, um, Mike the Cops YouTube page. We're starting to roll out a lot of the behind the scenes videos. Um, like when we went up in the air with the Tucson aerial team, we interviewed the police chief, our border documentaries, that all goes out through there. Um, we've got a series of wounded officer retreats that we're going to be doing in small groups. We're going to bring them out to Connecticut, um, take care of them, bring in, um, we've got a PTS expert, myofascial release, a police chaplain. Um, so we've, we've got a lot of initiatives that are coming up. So uh, I hope that your followers will go check out lawenforcementtoday.com, subscribe, um, hit me up on LinkedIn. I, I want to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. You will never hurt our feelings by telling us that we are doing something wrong as long as you tell us how we can do it better. You know, that's such an important point because, again, you know, organizations like yours, like ours, you know, we don't just blindly support everything police officers do. And, you know, of course, there are, you know, mistakes made in certain professions. But, you know, and I always say that, you know, yeah, cops make mistakes. So do doctors and teachers and this and that. 250,000 at least medical mistakes uh, done by medical personnel, but we're not uh, every year, but we're not, you know, protesting hospitals. We're not throwing a ton of doctors in prison, things like that. Kyle Reyes, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us today. And if you'd like more information about us, visit the National Police Association at nationalpolice.org. Ma'am, put the gun down! Do put the gun down! Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.